Hi everyone, welcome to Moads in the Artist Studio. My name is Maya Sadler, and today I am here with Jeffrey Henson Scales. Jeffrey Henson Scales began making photographs at age 11 after his parents gave him 30 years of life magazines and a Leica camera. Well, thank you so much for coming through, Jeffrey. We really appreciate you for coming and we're really excited to chat. Um, I wanted to first know what is the story of how you got your first camera? Uh, well, thanks for having me. Great to be back in the city here. But in terms of my first camera, my father was an amateur photographer, so we always had a dark room. And uh, he gave me a old Leica when I was really young. And he used to always, one of the Saturday things I'd do with my father is we'd go and uh, try to find used cameras at pawn shops mm -hmm. and different stores. And so every Saturday I would drive around with dad to look for old cameras. And then not long after that, uh, one day he comes home with a big file box. He says, oh, you'll probably like this. And it was every issue of Life magazine from 1936 to that present year, which was probably 1964 or something. Mm -hmm. And every issue of Look magazine. So then that was like a very early education in in documentary photography because I just poured over those magazines for years and years. Mm. And so that was kind of training at a very early age. And I ultimately traded the Leica in for a Pentex Spotmatic because it was easier to use. And, right. um, so I always had cameras. He was, you know, he was always buying and selling cameras. That was his thing. Mm -hmm. And your mom was a painter. Um, when, so when he brought you those cameras and the uh, magazines, did you feel like you had to um, go into photography? You had to study these and use this camera? Or did you already just desire to? Um, and that was kind of how it, it happened. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. I like doing it. Mm -hmm. That's all um, it takes, really. You know, and having a dark room at the house, you know, everything was right there. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that. I gravitate to it. I wanted to learn to play guitar, and I remember my parents sent me to the Johnny Otis Music School mm -hmm. in Berkeley. And I wasn't as good as the other people, and I was enjoying my photographs more, and I sort of drifted back to photography. I said, I can get my head around this easier. Right. I love it. Trying to learn to play the guitar, which I was not very good at it. Still not very good at it. Guitar is hard. I'm still learning as well. <laughs> um, so the summer of 1967, you want to stay in Berkeley in San Francisco. It's going to be the summer of love. Um, but your parents are like, actually, I think you need to visit family in the Midwest and spend your summer that way. Um, can you tell us about that summer and how it impacted your future work? Well, you know, before we lived in Berkeley, we lived in the Haight-Ashbury and then we moved Berkeley, so all my friends were over there, so I was always going over there, which, you know, that was in the heyday of the Haight-Ashbury. I got caught one night climbing out the window of our house to go see Jimi Hendrix at the Fillmore Auditorium. Valid. And uh, so they said, you know, not a good summer for him just to be up to his own devices right. in Haight-Ashbury as a 13-year-old. Right. So they said, you're going to stay with my sister, my father's sister. Minnesota, and then you're going to meet your grand meet with your grandmother, and they're going to take you around to see different relatives in Chicago, Davenport, Iowa, Detroit, and various and various places. My aunt, she was in uh, St. Paul, mm -hmm. so you know we went to Des Moines, we went here, we went there, and we were supposed to go to Detroit, but that was the long hot summer of 1967 where there were riots in a lot of cities mm -hmm. and uh, we were going to go to Detroit but it literally was on fire so we wound up just going to Chicago and uh, it was it wasn't a riot but it was very tense and it was, there was a heavy police presence mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen that sort of inner city community th up close that much because growing up in Berkeley it was you know, sort of not that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was fascinating, and my grandmother got me an Instamatic camera, and, you know, I took a few pictures, and uh, I remember I took the one picture that was in the show, uh, Chicago 1967, 
it was on like a little balcony on a relative's apartment and the cops were like arresting some people downstairs and I was like taking pictures over the side and that was a you know a picture that I hadn't seen in 50 years but I right. just resurfaced yeah um, and it did move me to be more active in civil rights and improving urban conditions because it was it was kind of shocking to me mm -hmm. not a reality that I had been around and then when I came back uh, uh, the Panther thing had started going in and actually if I can go back I'm sorry but definitely um, the, the, it, in May before that summer mm -hmm. at our family's house in Berkeley we had a big party we had this sort of grand room at our house where we had these fundraising benefits and when Stokely Carmichael handed off the chairmanship of SNCC to H. Rap Brown they had this celebration and ceremony at our house so mm -hmm. there was like a hundred or so people there and a band and wow. all that and that was like really exciting um, you know Stokely gave a speech and all of that and Rap Brown gave a fiery speech mm -hmm. um, and so then I'm that summer, I went out to the Midwest, and there was, you know, the urban situation I saw, and then I came back and uh, started getting involved with the, with the Panthers, you yeah. know, taking pictures of them, because that Berkeley, Oakland, that was, you know, the this, this centerpiece of mm -hmm. the Panthers. And my father had known Eldridge Cleaver, mm -hmm. um, and he told me in the 90s, which, uh, you know, the famous poster of Huey Newton sitting in the, the tan chair. He said, oh yeah, I helped my friend Blair Stapp take that picture at uh, Beverly Axelrod's apartment in San Francisco. And I said, this is in like 1990-something. I go, Dad, <laughs> you're telling me this now? <laughs> he goes, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, because it feels like to him it, it wasn't something that needed to be shared with a bunch of people or even to his son it was just something he was doing for the cause to help out yeah or his friend his yeah there his friend was make, taking a picture yeah um well yeah i would love to know a little bit more about um how you started with the panthers maybe who was kind of the first person that you had access to that let you mm -hmm. um kind of meet everybody else and get integrated with the movement well, I, um i remember one day i was at the Panther office and you sort of when you first interface with the Panthers the first thing they get you to do is sell their newspapers and then I started taking pictures and I said well you know I gave them some pictures that they could use in the paper they said okay well you should do some more and one day I was at the office in Oakland I was sitting there and Bobby Seale was there and David Hilliard and Eldridge Cleaver came in and Bobby says Oh, Elders, this is Jeffrey Scales. Uh, he's going to be taking some pictures for the pan, for for the paper. And Elders was the editor of the paper at that time. And he's sitting there, and he goes, Jeffrey Scales, is your father Emmett Scales? I said, yes, he is. Do you still live in that big house in the Berkeley Hills? I said, yes, we do. He says, well, you need to have a party for my book coming out, Soul on Ice. I said, well, I'll ask him. And we did have that party. Yeah, seems like it. <laughs> Wow. I remember my mother, funny story, there was a, a man named Reverend Earl Neal who was a spiritual advisor of the Panthers and it was at his church where the breakfast program was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my mother comes up to him, um, interracial parents, my mother's white, and he, she comes up and says, oh, uh, Jeffrey, working with the Panthers and being involved is just great. It's just like the Boy Scouts, which to me was horribly embarrassing at the time. <laughs> right. And Father Neil just sort of looked at me and smiled. And, but it wasn't soon after, in retrospect, I said, that's pretty funny. But. Yeah, in retrospect, yeah, pretty funny. So he said, Bobby said, you know, Jeffrey's going to be taking some pictures for the, pan, for the paper. So I started taking pictures. And they would call me whenever an event would happen, or they'd say, well, this is going to happen. Can you come down and take some pictures? And there was another photographer named Stephen Shames, who was a professional black star photographer. And 
he started mentoring me. I would follow him around and he would sort of give me guidance on how to do things. Um, and then eventually, you know, Elch said, well, you can also work on the paper. So, you know, I really wanted to work on a newspaper. I'm not sure why that is and how it came to be that I still am working on a newspaper. But uh, um, so I used to always go over to his house here in San Francisco, I remember, you know, there'd be this like 14 year old kid knocking on his door. And, you know, right. Are we gonna work on the paper today? And he'd go, oh, no, no, not today, not today. <laughs> but then he'd put, you know, load me up in his car and we'd drive to a book signing or drive here, drive there. Uh, okay, so, um, so they would, uh, the Panther leadership, Bobby or David Hilliard would, would call me when there was an event or something. And at one point they started having regular rallies at Defermery Park uh -huh. in Oakland, which uh, was later renamed to Little Bobby Hutton Park by the Panthers. But so they would have rallies fairly frequently. So I was spending a lot of time down there taking photographs of, you know, just the rallies and you know, the people there. And that was, you know, that was a lovely place to be. It's a, it's a nice park. Yeah. Something I really like about this photograph is this woman here. Um, I think in uh, contemporary, spectators. yes. Yeah, that's an interesting picture, just the clothing uh, and how they look. You got a couple of Panthers on the side there. Yeah, I think for me, some of the contemporary depictions of Panthers in movies and, and TV, um, they like to create a narrative that there was a divide between the Panther Party, pe people who were active members, um, and people who were, who were black people who were just living in Oakland and Berkeley, um, and as if there was like people who, uh, I mean, of course, there's you know, black people are not a monolith, and there may pe maybe people who resisted um, the what the Black Panthers were trying to do, but I think it's also important to show that there were people who weren't a part of the party. Um, and who uh, may have been older than the demographic that the the party was um, influencing, um, but we're still very much here for the cause because at the end of the day, it was just about the right to live and and not mm -hmm. be surveilled and not be harassed and killed. Well, and also a big part of the the, the Panthers' mission and the phrase that they used a lot was serving the people, serve the people. So there was a lot of community outreach. And they would do food programs, and they did the breakfast program. So a lot of community people really appreciated it. While there was tension between the traditional civil rights movement, you know, that was represented by Dr. King primarily, and the Panthers, who did take a approach that involved being armed, and so there was some reservation about that. But the, but there was also a lot of appreciation because people in the community of all ages knew that the Oakland police were being way too heavy handed and it was like a problem. And right. They appreciated that. Um, so there was some tension, but there were always like a wide range of age people. I mean, the, the people in the party tended to be younger, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, there's always a lot of sort of older community people around at the events. Right. Um, you mentioned that whenever, or maybe not whenever you come here, but something you wanted to do now that you're back here briefly was visit Alameda County Courthouse mm -hmm. um, and take a selfie possibly. Um, I wanted to know like your experience being such a young person during um, Huey Newton's trial mm -hmm. and documenting the trial and being at that courthouse. It, it, I, I feel like I read you went there regularly or went to his, went to visit him regularly. I would visit him regularly once or, yeah, usually about once a week, maybe twice sometimes mm -hmm. uh, during the trial. And I went to a lot of the trial itself, and, mm -hmm. um, which was just fascinating. His attorney, Charles Gary, was also my father's attorney. Um, so you'd have to get down to the courthouse at like six or seven in the morning and get in line and they'd search you and, uh, you know, then you'd go in. I remember Bobby Seale kept saying, you know, you know, get that Leica you, you said you had and, you know, put it in your, you know, in your, in your inner thigh. They won't, they won't touch you there. You can get the camera into the courtroom and take some 
take some photos, which I never went that route because they always search you and then, you know, what, I'm going to be in there taking pictures. And right. <laughs> right. But you know, I, appreci- I really appreciated that kind of the encouragement he gave me to, like, be a photographer and, and things like that. It's like, you know, go the extra distance to get a picture. And I did, it, that didn't occur to me at the time, but that's something that's traveled with me my entire career. Right. Um, but yeah, that big, huge building, and they would have those those great rallies outside in front, and the, the honor guard or the uh, is it the honor guard is what they call them in the you know when the, in the military things with the flags and whatnot. Ooh, they yeah. Line up. Very choreographed and impressed with everybody in their black leather jackets. Mm-hmm. And this is summertime, right? This is summer. So it's hot in those leather in the leather, but we got to keep up the. Well, it's the Bay Area. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about this pretty iconic photograph of Huey Newton. Um, this is a photograph that was uh, you didn't find until recently. This hasn't been just out accessible. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, All if you the ones c- you've shown so far. Right. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know a little bit about this moment because um, he's looking at you. Um, it also feels like he's looking beyond you as well, but I do feel like there's a strong eye contact. But what was it like being in this moment? Well, that was uh, his first press conference after he was released from jail. Mm-hmm. He was free. Right. You know, it was years, that was 1970, so it had been two years of free Huey, and this was the day he was free. Right. And the world around the Panthers had dramatically changed in the, from the time he went into jail when he came out. Like, there was maybe half a dozen Panther officers around the Bay Area when he went in jail. And by the time he came out, there was maybe 60 mm. across the country. And there was a global sort of move, appreciation and involvement. Um, so that was an, an intense kind of moment. Big press conference with Huey Newton was out of jail, and that was the last picture I think I did of the Panthers was that press conference. Um, wow! And I can't remember why that is, but you know, just looking at film, that's ni- nothing I did of the Panthers goes past 1970. Mm. So you think this is the last photograph, or this was the last year that you did photograph? That was the last photograph. Interesting. That's a really good last photo, I think. Um, I wanted to know um, how you developed your photography ethic um, and how your relationship with the Black Panthers might have informed that. It's something I'm always thinking about when I think about photography, and particularly photography of Black people. Well, it, 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 the involvement with the Black Panthers as is being an activist. So that affected my ethics that, you know, you always, you want to try to improve the world, you want to try to contribute to things. Um, I know many years later when I was living in New York and trying to work as a commercial photographer, I was asked by a publication, I had been doing photographs for Black Enterprise magazine, which was a very, very supportive client. Mm -hmm. Business photography, not my biggest interest, but, you know, they were great people to work with, you know, and they, you know, paid me regularly for a long time. So I had a lot of that in my portfolio. A major news magazine called me and said, uh, can you come in and have a meeting? I said, well, it was during the cracking epidemic. I said, we want you to... uh, we're doing a cover on the crack ep- epidemic and we want you to shoot the cover. And uh, so we want, uh, we want you to go around and shoot pictures of, of black men getting arrested by the police. And uh, I said, well, they don't have to be being arrested for crack cocaine. We just want pictures of them being arrested. Mm. And at the time I was, I guess you would call it a starving artist. I was like, hmm. So I spent a day driving around looking for this, and then over the course of the day, the rage just started to build. Mm -hmm. Like the nerve that these guys were going to put just guy that's getting arrested for shoplifting, say crack epidemic, or or just being stopped. 
And so then I went home and I wrote him a note and I said, that was really offensive, what you're doing. And, um, you know, I thought about it, I spent a day thinking about it, and no, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you still have to pay me. Wow. Which they did. Uh, I love that. And then they published it, a cover that I'm not sure where they got it, and was police and some brothers getting hassled or whatever. And then the following week, they put a correction saying, these men were not involved in crack cocaine whatsoever. Hmm. So they literally were just projecting a black person engaged with the police, part of the cracking. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would love to also talk about um, your work with music. I know you worked with Minnie Ripperton and with Cher. You have a really funny story on your Tumblr about um, your experience with Cher. I'll let people go to um, his Tumblr. It's called Time Variance. Um, I had a really good time looking through that. Um, but yeah, how did you get into touring and equipment managing and everything else you were doing with well, music? Well, among the many things that my father did, he was he managed musicians. He managed the Kingston Trio and here in San Francisco for a period of time. Uh, and then he also worked at uh, the Hungry Eye. I think that's the name of it. I'm pretty sure it's a famous club. And he also worked at like nightclubs recording things. And uh, so I was around musicians. We used to have rehearsals at our house. Uh, Tremaine Hawkins used to rehearse at our house. Wow. Uh, Sly Stone's sister had a, was in a group called Little Sister and they used to rehearse at our house. So oh, that's cute. Been around musicians a lot. And my father also had a high end audio store. And he would do installations and you know, I was small, you know, I was in second, third grade, and I was the person that had to go behind the furniture to drag all the cables because I was small. <laughs> so I was around gear mm -hmm. a lot. And then uh, I was, I went to UCLA briefly and ran into one of the other women in that group, Little Sister, with Sly Sister, a woman named Mary McCreary, and she was down there recording an album, and I hadn't seen her in years, and so I started hanging out and helping her with her equipment. Then somebody asked me to help them with their equipment, and then uh, I wound up working for some band. Oh, uh, I think Larry Coryell, the troubadour, and then somebody wanted me to go on tour with the Pointer Sisters and Dan Hicks on a tour. And then Irving Azoff's company wanted me to go be roadie for this the first rock band from behind the Iron Curtain, Locomotive GT, and uh, I was, wasn't doing good at UCLA, and so they said, well, you have to come out to New York, and I said, boom, I'm there, because I always wanted to go to New York. And after that, these, these high-profile management companies would bring me on with a new group to help them get their equipment ready for, like, major tours, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, after at one point, someone said, you know, you should meet Minnie Ripperton. She's looking for somebody, and I think you guys would really like each other. Mm -hmm. So they arranged a meeting, and I went over, spent an afternoon with her at her house, and uh, we became, you know, she became my big sister. Yeah. And then I became her tour manager uh, for the remainder of her career. Uh, then I worked, you know, with various other people at one point, Somebody offered me a gig to go on the road with Cher, which was it was a, a fun job as a roadie because I'd been a road manager and I stopped when when Minnie died. I said I'm going to devote all of my energy to photography because without the kind of commitment I had to her, I can't see doing that. I need to put that energy into myself. Mm -hmm. but then at some point, economic wise, I you know I felt I had to get out of L.A. for one reason or another. He said, well, you can go on the, you can be Cher's roadie. So ah, I'll do that. Because we only did Caesar's Palace for two weeks, two weeks off, and then two weeks at Harris Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't allowed to touch the equipment because they were union houses. Okay. So that's a roadie gig I can work <laughs> with. You know, I just have to drive the truck back and turn the amps on. Exactly. 
And it was really fun because she was just a delight to be around. Um, and she a, was a real hard worker. And uh, we had a lot of fun. I did that for like a year. That was the last time I did that sort of work, except for some equipment design work I did for some other people. But I had sort of transitioned into doing my own photography, I think. even at, I'd even already done the, 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 the Jackson's album cover when I went out on the road with Cher. Oh, wow. Okay. So. Cool. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about some of your commercial shoots you've done. You've got some pictures that I really love personally that I wanted to talk about. This first one is Tracy Chapman. I'm not sure the year, um, but yeah. I think that was publicity photography for an album called One from the Heart, mm -hmm. I believe. Anyway, uh, one of the people that I worked with when I was working with equipment and road work there's a manager named Elliot Roberts, and I'd done a lot of work with them, and uh, he was managing Tracy Chapman, and I wrote him, I said, you know, I've been doing photography professionally, and I would love to shoot Tracy Chapman, and he said, okay. Uh, and they hired a really expensive photographer to shoot the cover, you know, Herb Ritz, who's, you know, famous and charged tens of thousands and then they said, well, we want you to do the publicity pictures. And so I did that. And, you know, it was a nice shoot. She was very pleasant. Shot it in a daylight studio. She's not the real chatty person. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. I liked that. Mm -hmm. It was a studio I used to use all the time on Late Street in, in uh, Tribeca. Okay. So this next photo I wanted to talk about is the shoot that you did with Onyx, Heavy D, and DeBrat. Oh yeah, that was a fun shoot. That was for a magazine called Young Sisters and Brothers, YSB, uh, which was a real fun client I had. Uh, some great designers, Flo Wilson and Lance Pettiford. But it was for a special gatefold issue about artists against AIDS or artists to raise awareness for AIDS. And we shot for like two or three days, and it was going to be like a gatefold where you have maybe 10 people total in it, and we shot them in separate groups. But uh, they were fun. Uh, uh, Onyx was a hoot. I mean, they were just hilarious. Um, so, and, and Jodeci was you know, one of the other groups, or at least the three of Jodeci that showed up that day. And then Method Man was, was in the other shoot, uh, and some other people whose names escaped me at this particular moment. But that was fun. It was a nice, big photo shoot. Thank you so much. And the last image I wanted to talk about um, is this one sheet that you did for Crooklyn. Crooklyn. This is my one of my favorite movies on the planet. I've seen it an unhealthy amount of times. And so I, I had to ask about this, how you got, how you met Spike, how you um, got into doing the one sheet, what it was mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Uh, I met Spike. American Film Magazine had me photograph him when She's Gotta Have It came out. And he's was very proactive in trying to hire black creatives. So when magazines would call him, he would say, hey, call Jeffrey or, you know, uh, for the magazine stuff, because he had his brother doing the on-set stuff. And uh, so the magazines would call me and I would, you know, go take pictures. So at one point, he said, I want you to do the one sheet for Crooklyn. And I worked with his art director, Art Sims, we did a lot of different ideas. And with movie posters, most of them are collages and they're very art directed. Um, I mean, I did another poster after this for uh, Major Pain. Oh, wow. That's and, another movie I've seen too many times. And uh, in that one, they sent me the exact drawing of what they wanted. With this one, we sort of did different ideas you know, without drawings. And this is a rare movie poster that's actually one frame that's not a composite, mm -hmm. which is very rare. Yeah. Art Sims, the designer, he added those colors, you know, the oversaturated colors. Mm -hmm. But we shot that on the set. We shot that in Brooklyn where they were shooting the movie. 
it was a big production. Like, you know, I had to bring in lots of light, and it was a, it was a union situation, so there was, you know, I had to get a prop person to bring in that little record player, and every little thing was, but they were great people to work with, the actors, uh, Delroy and Alfred were just a delight to be around. Yeah, I can tell, he looks excited you know, to be here. I mean, we shot so many ideas for that. I got, you know, I got a manhole cover we had made that said Crook Me on it. Ah. Made out of, you know, styrofoam. <laughs> <laughs> looks like a manhole. Right. It doesn't weigh like one, of course, in the movie. Right. Well, thank you so much for discussing those pictures, especially Crooklyn. Um, my last question is just what artists have influenced you the most, particularly um, non-photographers? Mm, so many. Uh, non-photographers. Yeah. I feel like we've talked a lot about the photographers that have influenced you. Uh, filmmakers. Uh, uh, Antonioni, big influence on me. Mm-hmm. Bernardo Bertolucci was a big influence until I found out how him and Marlon Brando raped Maria Schneider, but, you know, mm. uh, he's been canceled. Yes, <laughs> we can do that for canceled sure. Canceled now. Uh, but I used to love to see those movies. Um, go to art. Uh, film influenced me a lot. Um, when I was... The year I got out of high school, KQED hired me as a producer-director trainee to train for a year as a producer-director, then work for KQED as a director-producer that's not far from here, actually, just up on Bryant Street is where they were at that time. So I was involved in film a lot. And that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And after I worked at KQED in the 70s, I had a reel, and I moved to L.A. thinking that, you know, a young black director could go down there and get a job directing like that and it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah. Which, in retrospect, as fate would have it, pushed me back again into photography more. Mm. Which, so I don't really have any regrets about that. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I mean, I used to, <laughs> I got a job working in a film lab, a movie film lab, uh, and uh, they would you have to make deliveries to the studios and so I would always volunteer because I had a change of clothes that I would change into like a suit and stuff <laughs> and once they got beyond the gate I'd try to go find people that I'd introduce myself to uh, which was not very successful I was naive but I had a good time yeah uh, painters you know Basquiat was pretty interesting to me you know in that brief time I loved the surrealist Mania Man. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, you know, and, and musicians are lots of influence from musicians. Yeah. But there's so much art and it affects you in different ways. Right. That's why I wanted to know about non photographers. But filmmakers the most, uh, just in terms of. Uh, there was a, a cinematographer named Vittario Storaro that did a lot of stuff with uh, Bertolucci and various people. I used to study cinematographers, how they would approach making the visuals for various movies and how they would treat their film and stuff. Mm -hmm. I studied that a lot. Just on your own time, just watching them and studying. Mm -hmm. Reading too many books. <laughs> Never too many books. Never. <laughs> no such thing. Tell that to my storage locker with the 40 <laughs> boxes of books. Listen <laughs> to the library in my house. But anyway, yeah, books are delightful. Yes. Well, on that note, thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for watching in the artist studio. Thank you to Jeffrey Henson Scales for being with me. This yeah. was fun. Thank you. <laughs>